All right, we're at episode number 13. And today we have JP. Thank you, JP, for joining. Happy to be here. Lucky number 13. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're still here at the launch pad. Thanks to Dalton that invited us today. So thanks, man. Today's going to be a very interesting interview. We got a whole lot of things to cover. And I want to just move away from the regular show format since JP has a lot of value to share with the entrepreneurs that are listening. Let's go ahead and JP, tell, tell the audience about your background and how do you get started? Sure. Years ago. Happy to. I'm probably your, your only naval architect that's been interviewed so far. Wow. <laughs> that was my degree. I graduated. I grew up in Louisiana, so I'm happy to be back in New Orleans and always loved the water, you know, kind of part fish, loved boats. And so whenever we'd be out fishing, I'd always be thinking about how the boat could have been improved. And I wanted to design basically boats or yachts. So I, there were only four schools in the in the country that offered naval architecture. And Three of them were in a very cold climate, which I wasn't used to, and the fourth was in Berkeley. So I, I decided on California, but my dad, ultra conservative guy, so when I said the words Berkeley, UC Berkeley, I think he <laughs> he almost fainted. So we had this deal that I would go two years to a Jesuit like liberal arts school, and my sister had gone to a Jesuit school, and she loved it. And then if I still wanted to do naval architecture, I could transfer in to the program at Cal. So I went two years to Santa Clara. And then I finished up two years at Cal and graduated from there with a BS in naval architecture. So it's uh, probably the only naval architect you'll have on this show. Yeah. <laughs> there aren't a whole lot of them out there. And uh, from there, my first job was with the U.S. Navy. And so I was a naval architect for them. And I gravitated towards a group called Full Scale Trials, which basically took ships and submarines out after they were built. And we were, the easiest way to explain it is we were like the road and track guys for the Navy, like you'd take it out and you'd basically run it through performance tests and see how well the ship or submarine performed to design. So it was a lot of fun. We traveled all over the world. And what I learned very quickly was that submarines were way more fun than surface ships because all the guys on submarines were really smart. So it made our job super easy, you know, because you'd ask a question like where something was, boom, the guy knew exactly where it was. He'd take you there. And it was just a lot of fun. I had so much respect so many bright people. Why do you think that, like, why the submarines know they so They test much? them in. <laughs> yeah, they test them in that way. So there's a okay. big filter up front for the submarine fleet to get to be in the submarine fleet. You had to do a lot of testing. And so it was the creme de la creme of, of the Navy would be the submarine guys. And so I worked on that for a while and then got involved in a what's called a special project or black project, classified project. And so a couple interesting books were written about that. I can either confirm or deny the accuracy, but I can tell you they're really interesting books. And then just recently when I got back here, I met the wife of a Navy diver who was on one of the original submarines that predated me by like 20 years and what I did on two special project submarines, the USS Parchy and the Richard B. Russell. And so it was really fascinating to kind of hear her story and to see the book that I had read previously. It's called Blind Man's Bluff, and it's all about submarines. But to see, to see the book, she gave me the book because I lost mine in a fire. And to see what she underlined and kind of the notes that she had was really, really interesting because her husband had since passed away. So that was kind of my first kind of what we call an entrepreneur job was what I define it as with when you're in, in an organization, but you're doing something, you're kind of tapped to do something that's never been done before. So it's kind of like a startup, but it's within an existing organization. And so like we were talking about before we got on the podcast, in so many ways, it's so much easier. I didn't have an appreciation. I thought what I was doing was really hard, but it's so much easier than, than being an entrepreneur and having to fundraise, having to build your team, usually from scratch where you don't know the people. Like One of the biggest benefits of entrepreneurs is, is you kind of know who you're getting involved with and you know their track record. And so I could always cherry pick what kind of people I wanted on my team. And it was usually a high profile project. And so you could attract the best and the brightest to the project. And so as a result, it was kind of almost, I wouldn't say easy to succeed, but you had so many more advantages than being a typical entrepreneur. And usually funding was set. There was high executive sponsorship for the project. So that was my first one. So was with the Navy was to, to put this, these special sonar on these two submarines and so to, to enhance the safety of what they were trying to do. And so that was just, I didn't, I worked on the project for six years. I had no idea what I was really working on. 
And then at the very end, I got read in to what was really happening. Wow. And that was pretty exciting and pretty amazing just to know what these guys were actually doing and the, the way they risked their lives and, and the type of intelligence they were getting back. It was, it was really mind So, uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's uh, just dig into that whole notion of entrepreneurship without uncertainty. That will be entrepreneurship. You get a set budget. You can build your own team stuff, guys, you name it, engineers or whoever is going to be part of your team. So how does that feel, talking about emotions? How do you feel in those six years? Well, I think one of the keys for me that I learned later, and I didn't really appreciate it at the time, but one of the things about the military was we had budget and we had time, but it had to be right the first time. And so the concept of minimum viable product you know, wasn't out yet. It was the okay. exact opposite. It, like it had to be everything in the product and perfect right when it launched wow. and so in so many ways it was Were they life involved in that if like yeah it was a life and death situation like if you screwed it up oh people God. died and so i kind of got almost the world's worst training to be an entrepreneur from our first job because i had good budget and i was able to pick the people on the team and and i had time to do it right because we usually started maybe two years before something needed to be deployed those were the timelines And, but it absolutely had to be right and had to be thoroughly tested and everything. So it was really rewarding, the work I did, especially once I found out what was going on. But I think in so, in so many ways, it's such a different problem than, than what a tip, traditional entrepreneur today has to do. And it's almost like it, that fed right into kind of my belief system of doing the right thing and the engineering training, which is like, you know, you're always trying to make 100 on every test and showing that you understand the engineering concepts. And so... In entrepreneurship, it's like almost an entirely different skill set. So I did that for my first eight years out of school. And then as that program, because that was the end of the Cold War, was towards the end of my career there, I knew I was probably going to do something else within the Navy. And I thought at that time I'd had my first child. My wife and I had had our first child. And I just wanted to be able to give him kind of every opportunity that, that he had, so private education or whatever. And so at that point, I decided to go into private industry. And so the guys who were working for the sonar company came out to sell me a sonar. And I said, hey, guys, I think I'm going to be leaving. So don't kind of don't waste your breath. And they're like, oh, instead of how many do you want to buy, how many do you want to sell? <laughs> so the CEO is like, come work for us. And so they happened to be in San Diego, which is a place when I was in California for school. I traveled all over the state with buddies from college and just loved San Diego. So it just felt right. Now, I kind of made a mental note when I was traveling through San Diego with a good friend that I would love to be there. And so they were there and it just all worked out. But the, the massive shift in mindset, the defense industry to their private industry where almost nothing that they launched worked the first time, it was really, really stressful for me. So I had the geographic change. I was married now and I had a, a kid. So all the kind of approaches that I used in the military, almost none of them matched what I had to do in that next job. And so I just started with kind of a general I can't even remember what my title was. It was a little company called RD Instruments. But one of the main reasons I was excited about joining was they wanted me to start a new business unit. And so that's another entrepreneur project. I actually had two jobs there where I would do basic sales engineering. And, but also they said, okay, why don't you start this business unit and do that as well? It's called a navigation business unit. So I was using these same sonars in the way that we were using them in the Navy but trying to build a new market to use them for autonomous underwater vehicles and uh, remotely operated vehicles, as well as the military application. So basically build that from scratch. So that was kind of my second entrepreneur project with them. And that uh, it went really, really well. We grew from like zero, I think, to three million. And at that time, it was only a $20 million company. So a fairly large fraction of them. And I looked at the website recently, and I still know both founders and I was proud of the fact that we launched these products in the mid 90s and 50% of the products that we launched are still they're still actively selling nice. them today from the mid 90s so it was, I was shocked to see that. Well, we usually go over the model, I mean the business model, the market and and how you guys make money. So you you talk about going to the private sector now and before we even with Dalton in his episode we were talking about the difference between lifestyle businesses or cash flow businesses versus startup, you can definitely get a competitive edge on a cash flow business if you operate as a startup with that innovative thinking and 
being creative and lean and all of that. But do you see any difference in this private sector? It was a cash flow business. It was not a startup at all, right? Correct. So it was basically, again, so the budget certainty was there. I didn't have to personally go out and fundraise. They would said, we want you to create it. There weren't a lot of resources, but it was all the shared services inside the organization that I didn't have to worry about. You know, there was accounting already done. Taxes for the company were already done. So all the minutia of that you have to do as a founder, I didn't have to worry about. I could literally almost focus entirely on product and market. The budgets were actually very simple. We didn't spend a lot of time on that because almost by definition, and that was one of the things we were talking about before we got on, is when you're doing an entrepreneur project, there's almost always high-level executive sponsorship, like the founders wanted to do this, or at least one of the two. I found out later that there was a big debate over whether they should do that or something else. But essentially, they really it was, it was, there was a high sponsorship, so they wanted it to succeed. And there was always competition for resources, what I was doing versus lots of other things in the company. That was the interesting thing about this company. It was like organized chaos. There were so many projects and very few resources. So you you really had to kind of fight for resources, which I wasn't used to in, in the military. Once I got my budget, I tasked the people and said, hey, we're going to work on this. They were like all in and not distracted. But I had people working on my projects at, at the other company and people were trying to steal them and get them on their projects and, and everything else. But it ended up working out well. And what I focused on was making sure we hit the financial projections, which were very modest in the beginning because we were growing from zero, but it was all profitable growth kind of from the get-go. And because we didn't need to invest in all the traditional things, all the equipment and everything else to, to, to make the product or do that, I didn't have to worry about that. All I had to do was worry about knowing what the capability of the product was and finding those customers for the market. And that's what I did really well. And it was kind of what I was, I had great aptitude for was just having that innate sense for, okay, what are the capabilities of this? Let's go find the people who could really use those capabilities. I call it the bullseye. You know, there's like all these things that your product can do, but I like to shrink it down to say, if you, if you could tell somebody about the product or hear their needs and see that the product is a, such a high match for them, your close rate on those sales would be 90% or higher. That's what I call the bullseye. It's like that's where I wanted to spend my time to get a lot of traction like immediately. And so that's what I focused on. But it was profitable business from the beginning, but mainly because I didn't have to worry about all the investment of that startup of all the things that you typically had to worry about. This was the mid-90s, right? So it's not would have been much more expensive to start that now. There was test equipment, tanks that you had to do. They had boats to test the sonar, just a lot of fixed costs that I didn't have to worry about. So like I said before we got on, entrepreneurship versus entrepreneurship, whole different setup, which I didn't have an appreciation for until I became an angel investor. Yeah, I, that's exactly where I want to touch now. Craig and Dalton, whenever we we reach the next segment of the of the podcast, we were free to kind of like do a freestyle type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> Just to open, openly share whatever thoughts you guys want to ask JP. But I, I want to touch on... On the investment, since Greg mentioned that you were now working into some angel investing, I know we have the whole Robert Kiyosaki quadrant of employees, self-employees, entrepreneurs, and now we can add entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. but then it's investors. So we don't talk a whole lot about investors. And last week, and we head down to Shreveport to the LA startup price. There was a couple. There were a couple angels down there, so it was kind of like a discussion round tables. And I got a chance to talk to one of them, and I asked him, "So why why are you investing?" And in fact, I asked him specifically, "How much of your net worth are you putting into these deals?" And he said, "Very little." And did he give you a percentage? He says less than seven percent. Okay, so so in the group that I joined, I was very fortunate. I, I joined a group called Tech Coast Angels, and they're based in Southern California. Before you even could join, or right when you join, you were afforded the ability to, to take this Power of Angel Investing course. And so what I got to do was hear from guys who had done literally hundreds of angel deals, learn from what they've already learned kind of through the school of hard knocks. And what they said is 10% of your net worth, no more than that in angel deals. And then specifically in any one deal, you figure you have to do 10 deals. So if you do 10% 10, 10 of your net worth and you're doing 10 deals, assuming your net worth's constant over the time that you're going to do your first investment, you're going to do 1%. So let's say pick a number for an average angel investor. 
your net worth is $5 million, 10% is $500,000, and then 1% for each deal would be 50 k And then they say, because there might be a pay-to-play round, you would actually do half of that again. So basically, you think a guy is like worth $5 million, he'd put in more than, more than 25 k per deal, but all the guys that I met, they were in those numbers. Now, I had lots of guys who were worth more than that, so they would put in 100 k and Different guys, depending on their age and their risk tolerance and everything else, they might put more in. But there were super angels in that group and angels. So there would be any people putting in anywhere from, you know, usually the max was maybe 100K per, per deal. And then the low end was 25K. And then as the economy got soft, because I got an angel invest right when the economy was melting down. And I actually didn't know what I was doing, but I had a good co-lead. And I led my first deal like right when I joined the group, which didn't make a lot of sense to me. But they're like, just do it. It'll be fine. (laughs) And so I just jumped in and and led a deal. And it was right during the meltdown. Like literally we started fundraising before the meltdown in uh, October of 2008. And we closed the deal in, or when, I don't know, was the meltdown August or October? Anyway, I think we closed in October. But Mm -hmm. it was challenging to get get that done. But uh, we got it done. I can't remember what point I was making. Yeah, right no, no. Now. I think we were talking about the percentage of oh, yeah, your yeah. net worth, and you hit it right there. So he also mentioned this study that they're doing on Angels University of Pennsylvania. They're they're studying why angels invest. So I want to ask you if you have thought out into, well, if it's just 10% of my net worth, then there's where is the other 90%? We, we don't want to initially touch about that 90% of your investments, right. that's maybe more traditional type of investments. Right. But that 10%, and one of the things that he mentioned is return on involvement, which I never heard until mm-hmm. last weekend. Yeah. And also with your expertise in the past 20 years, you can add a lot of value, which is the smart money and being able to bring a lot of value to these entrepreneurs. Is that some of the reasons why you think you can get in, engaged into in angel investing? Yeah, I think the other thing too was as the I had lost like everybody and there were different stock market meltdowns. I felt like the market was maybe a crapshoot and I I liked the idea of doing deeper due diligence on a company and being able to know more about the company on a not a day-to-day basis, but a month-to-month basis, let's say, and just being able to do more due diligence and and have some big winners because that was the oh, that was the other part I was going to make is those 10 deals and then you do a half a percent because you might need to to, to, to match your investment to, for a pay-to-play round. So a third of those are going to be total washouts. Two to three are going to be kind of okay. And then, you know, you're hoping that there's going to be a home run in there. And a lot of the guys I was investing with had invested like right before the internet boom in a company called Sandpiper Networks. That was their first really big deal. And then I just missed by a year or two their next big deal, which was Green Dot, which was uh, over 100x return. So in other words, wow. you got 100 times your money, whatever you put in. Put in 25K, you got out 2.5 million. So when you hear deals like that, obviously a lot of people start getting very interested in angel deals because they think, oh, well, that, that sounds good. Let me throw my 25K in. But they don't realize the hit rate on those is is low. And But mine was a, a kind of less altruistic because I was earlier in my career and more selfish in the sense that I wanted to know how investors thought because I could envision at some point being a true entrepreneur, not an entrepreneur, and doing my own company. And I wanted to sit on, I wanted to know what they were thinking when they were sitting on so I could just, my fundraising pitches would all be better because I would know kind of what they were looking for because I'd sat on the other side as well. And so I did that. And then there was the opportunity to contribute as well. And so it was a mix. And but and then the networking piece was great too. I mean, I met a lot of guys who had done a ton of angel deals. And so that was all things I, I didn't have to learn the hard way. And so later on in my angel career, unfortunately, I was asked to help out with some deals where guys had invested way too much of their net worth in one deal who didn't have the benefit I did, which was that formal training and angel investing and everything like that. And, and so I'm so grateful for all the guys that kind of took me under their wing as an early angel investor and, and of limited means compared to some people in terms of net worth. And they were very, very free with their time. And, and so it was, it was great. And I felt bad for the guys who, who didn't have that training and, and maybe overcommitted in one deal. And then that deal, any one deal, no matter how good it looks, can, can flame out. And so it's, it's really unfortunate where people put too much in any one deal. Now, is that, uh, you say, was it just a training or a 
It was no. like a, a three-day seminar, but it was also Who just... Who that? It was a guy by the name of Bill Payne, P-A-Y-N. Still doing that? I think so. And it was the seminar was called The Power of Angel Investing. And so they would take you through negotiating a term sheet and what you needed to know on the angel side. And so that was 2008. So the internet was around, but it, there was no angel list back then. Or right. some Are you the, actively doing some deals or not yet? Or? No, not right now. I mean, right now I'm, I'm inactive because I was letting the investments that I had done bake. And yeah. unfortunately, those, those deals had not worked out too well. I mean, some of them look promising. Been a tough market for those guys and a lot of them did a lot of fundraising. So we can segue to, I think, some of the mistakes that were made that I tried to advise against because that was the benefit of being an entrepreneur is I knew kind of when you're launching a product that's kind of in a revolutionary area using an indirect sales channel, which is like distributor reps or whatever. I just didn't believe that that was going to work because products were too technical. They were too involved and they were too high risk. And so you got a guy who's got a book of business that he's selling as a rep or a distributor, was he really going to take this new product that's unproven to his golden customer and try to book a, a $2 million deal? No, they're going to be super cautious typically. And there's more that we can talk about. But unfortunately, in two cases, one I invested in and one I didn't, I think they made the same exact mistake. And, and we can talk more about it. If you yeah, have. yeah. I'll do the last question, then just open it up and Craig can get more technical into the investing side of it. I just, I'm very curious about... And I wanted to ask you this as well. I know that the TV show, The Profit, it's been very popular there. I don't know if you heard yeah, about yeah, it. I really something. like it. Okay, okay. I mean, it seems like there's a common theme there with, with every show, but I'm very impressed with Marcus Lemos' his ability to like get in there and do stuff. And, and I don't know how much of it is scripted and how much right, tape a lot is, of reality is TV, taken. Because right? <laughs> I've heard, I, I know some entrepreneurs who've been on Shark Tank yeah. and how much filming they do versus how much is actually in this segment. Wow. But I haven't heard anything about how much filming they do on The Profit. But I think the concept is great because I think he gets people unstuck. Mm -hmm. And I think there's tremendous power in that. And I've, he's a guy that I really respect and admire from what I see on TV. And I want to I just expand on that because angel investing is just startup, high scaling type of companies expecting for an, or a, an exit or acquisition. And there is the chances are pretty remote. Like you don't have any control, but the profit of the show, you actually are. And there are two different types of businesses. You got right. the startup and the, and the cash flow. We, we kind of like talk about that already, but the business, the lifestyle type of business. So Mark, he will invest in already cash flowing businesses. Mm -hmm. Of course, he writes a big check for a big part of your business and he's right. the partner and then yeah. that whole thing. But do you think that something like that could work pretty much following the same angel investment principles and you say, hey, instead of investing on this platform that can could take off in seven years, why not follow some sort of the principle from angel investments into a typical small business type of thing and say, hey, I'm going to get 20% of your company if I give you 80000 but now you're getting cash flow. And next year, you're going to get a return. Yeah, and you see that on Shark Tank too, where they do those licensing deals and everything else. And I think I think it just depends on, I, I there was such a broad spectrum of angels in Tech Coast Angels and in Southern California where you had some doctors who really didn't have business experience but they had the net worth and they just they enjoyed kind of in the philanthropic way or just helping these entrepreneurs get going and and so in the healthcare industry where they knew certain things they were very valuable in in helping us vet and scrub and do the due diligence on specific deals but a lot of those guys didn't have specific business backgrounds but like Marcus Lemonis and probably Craig and others would be more qualified than me to talk about It's one is how much time you have. And a lot of angels, they don't have a lot of time. A lot of times they have a lot of opinion, but not a lot of time. And I read a quote somewhere. I, I wish I could remember who, who said it. Might have been Mark Andreessen or somebody like that. But if you listen to everything your board tells you and try to implement it, you will go bankrupt. I think I remember <laughs> reading something like that. So I think having that filter as a founder. And, and so the board, the your angel investors is almost like an extension of your board. So if, if you listen to everything your board says and try to do that and you'll go bankrupt, which is not my quote, but I, I've read it before from someone credible. Obviously, listening to all your angel investors would be even worse than that, right? Because it's, and so I think that's the thing that you, you have a lot of opinion. And one of the things I thought was it was inversely proportional a lot of times. The guys who put in the most money sometimes were the quietest, and the guys who put in the least were the, were the most active. And as a board member, that's really frustrating, right? Because you, you try to be diplomatic, but you kind of want to say, 
You know, dude, you got 10K in this deal. Like, forget about it. And just like, you can't really do that. And everyone is really, their heart's in the right place. They're trying to contribute. But when you're trying to filter through all that information, it's and, and they don't have all the information. But it kind of brings a, a different point to go back to what the entrepreneur can do. One of the things I've coached every entrepreneur I've been involved with in the deals, as I said, one of the things that you can really do if you know you're going to have multiple rounds of investment, be consistent about your communication with your investors. And so we have a, an entrepreneur who's done a great job of that. His, his name is uh, George, probably getting butchering his last name, but I think it's Eisenkamp. He's a CEO of Ground Metrics. And so they've done multiple rounds. And so I, I worked with George a, a bit on how to model his sales funnel and, and how to how to forecast accurately. And also the other thing I said was as a board member, one of the things that made my job easier was when the CEO was doing periodic regular updates and i said it doesn't matter what you pick whether it's monthly quarterly but do it consistently and when there's bad news keep doing it right because everybody shares the good news they don't share the bad news and then they're going to need funding and so then they've got to explain just so much easier if you're doing multiple rounds to just bite the bullet send out the update whether it's monthly or quarterly with good news bad news whatever but everyone's involved and if you do that you have so much more credibility and your, your next round of fundraising usually goes so much smoother. And that way you can let folks know kind of what's going on. And, and if you want to talk about it now or later, we can talk about kind of the, the mistakes that two companies made. And they blew through $10 million each. So I think that mistake was a big part of it. Wonderful. Craig, you want to take over those two? Yeah, yeah. Why don't you tell us a little bit more about those deals? Okay. Into that. Yeah, and I think it was one, I was talking to an ex-colleague of mine that we worked in, a, in an organization that just gave us tremendous experience. It was a company that grew from $30 million to about $600 million. It was a company called TTC that merged with a company called WWG, and it worked in the internet test. And so we got to see a lot of stuff that worked and a lot of stuff that didn't work because there was acquisitions in there and folding things together and... I was on the Salesforce side for a part of it and, and also did an entrepreneur project, entrepreneur project in there. But one of the things we saw was what worked and what didn't, especially with new technology launches. And so what both of these companies made in terms of a really key mistake was assuming that if they got the, the 800-pound gorilla to get interested in their technology and sign a deal to distribute their stuff that they thought, we're done. It's like, that's awesome. The sales are just going to start rolling in. But when you have new technology, you really have to ask that next set of questions is, well, who in the sales force is actually going to be selling our stuff? And are we educating them well on how to sell this new technology and how it's so much different than our own, the other technology? And so this, let me back up and say this is a B2B play, right? And so this isn't a B2C or whatever. And so this is a more, much more traditional sales model in terms of what these companies did. And so if you're in that model, and sometimes even if you're not, like Ubiquity Networks is a really good example of a company that had very disruptive technology and kind of also changed their sales force. But they did a great job of educating the sales force. And what they did that was really unique is they used the sales force itself to educate each other which was very innovative. And I thought they did a great job. But one of the keys that both of these startups made was assuming when they had that big deal with the 800-pound gorilla that those guys were just going to sell their stuff and the orders were going to start rolling in. Then the orders never came in. And of course, I had had the benefit of doing that twice where you said, you got a new product and you're putting it into an existing sales channel. You got to go teach those guys how to position the product. You got to go find out whether the product is right. Like the first product we launched, it was the very first DVR ever created. I think it had like 18 patents and it was used for surveillance, like like literally surveillance cameras. And so I went out on my first few sales calls. I had just been hired to do that. It was right after the Sonar Company. Everybody I talked to on that, that trip, the first question they asked is like, does it record 24 hours? No, no. And I was new to the surveillance industry, so I didn't know that. That was a key requirement. And so after like the 10th the no that I had to say, and I tried to position all the other things that were so cool, it was just a non-starter. So I flew back to the, the headquarters and went in with the general manager of that division. And I just said, this thing's dead on arrival. And it's like, and I said, the good news is if you take all the hard drives that you have, throw those out, we run the Best Buy, or I can't remember what the, what the retailer was at that time. I think Best Buy had just come out. 
and we go buy the newest, latest hard drives, and we put those in, that'll record 24 hours, and I can sell that. And so that almost like the minimum viable product concept, you got to go out there, you got to engage with customers, and you have to do that yourself in a really closed feedback loop. I think that's what, what's great if you can do that. And if you're, if you're relying on some external third-party sales force to do that, I just don't think that happens. You have to go out there, learn what people really want, what they really value, what they really need, and, and then tailor the development and the follow-on to that and, and tweak that product like we did, which is throw out all the hard drives or sell them and scrap and then get the new ones in that you needed because at, at that time the hard drive capacity was going up monthly or quarterly. So we, were, we just got lucky that the timing was right. But, but going out there and doing the, doing the research yourself and selling those first few units and learning what you need. And, and unless you have it all down and you're ready to equip the sales force with all that information, if you haven't done that, I think a lot of entrepreneurs who haven't had the luxury of being entrepreneurs before assume when they sign that big deal, whether it's a distribution deal or whatever, third-party sales force deal, they think, oh, we're done. It's like you got to go out do all that really heavy lifting of selling the product yourself. You know, I, I've seen a lot of young entrepreneurs who their entire team's talent is, is centered all around the creation component, building the product, innovation, design. But we had one of the guys in Shreveport at the startup said that that's only 20% of the work. And then they start leaning into their go-to-market strategy. They're coming in to the end of their runway of money, and they have not really started to sell. And if you ask anyone in the company to raise their hand, if they have a background in sales or sales management, it's crickets. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing. Yeah. And so I see that as a, a serious pain point for a lot of the, some of our best innovators that there really is no, they, yeah, they may have their go-to-market strategy written down, but where's the go-to-market talent in the yeah, company? Exactly. Yeah. Speak on that a little bit, how important that is. It is. It's, it's critical. And one of the things I learned in that same DVR division of uh, the company, which is part of Tyco now, what I was impressed with was the engineers who had that curiosity and they didn't mind going into the field because a lot of people say, well, we can't afford a sales force. It's like, yeah, that's right. That's why when you're hiring, you need to assess whether or not you have any engineers that have curiosity and the interest to be able to want to travel out and just they have that innate curiosity. I want to talk to customers. I want to see how this thing fits. I want, I want to meet face to face. So if you can evaluate whether some of your engineering talent has just innate sales skills or if they don't have the sales skills because you can team sometimes with other people and sometimes the CEO does or whomever. You might have a board member like me who, who would be happy to help and travel with you guys in, in the beginning. But assess there's sometimes there's latent sales and marketing talent in the company just because people are curious about the market. I think if you have the curiosity, it's enough to get you going. But in the absence of that, you absolutely need to find that, that talent. And a lot of times they say, well, when the product's ready, we're going to make that higher. But it's like there's such that there's like a, a step function right there where you want somebody on earlier than that who can have more of a ramp than a step function. So you're iterating the product. So when you're doing your full-blown launch, it's, it's, it's ready. So you had said that originally you got into angel investing because it would be a shortcut to learning some of the processes, being on this side of the table. But you seem to have stayed here. So what, what keeps you here? And wh why do you keep investing in, in young entrepreneurs? I think it's just it's inspiring and you kind of get hooked. I mean, to see what they were doing. We were talking again before we went on the air and the, the work that they have to do. And right now I'm working with an, an entrepreneur in Spain. And through no fault of his own, he had a fundraising deal. The company's called Win Inertia. And they make energy storage for the uh, renewable energy type products like wind and solar, et cetera. And through no fault of his own, he had a deal basically done at the final hour, there was fraud uncovered in one of the two inv investors, and it was a government entity in Spain. I don't know the details, but I know his deal blew up. And so, and unfortunately, he didn't have any backup investors, but that caused a real problem for him. And seeing him navigate through this and basically exist for through some really, really hard times, you just you want to help those guys. You know, you just admire them so much for their courage and their creativity and their resilience. You're just you get hooked. Like you any way you can help them, you just want to help them because it's you know what they're doing is so hard. You admire the hard work that they're doing and you just want to help. What are some good team dynamics you look for in a company you'd invest in? If you had to almost 
reverse engineer a great team that you would have invested in? What did that look like? It's funny because a lot of the ones that I've invested in have changed over the time. But I, I put maybe a lot of angel investors talk about, are you, are you betting on the, on the jockey or the horse? In other words, the company or the CEO? And what I've learned over time, for me, it's, this, it's all about the CEO. The CEO has to have the skills that I believe they need to have to really build that team. And so what I look for specifically, so the team, to answer your question directly, Craig, the team flows from the CEO. And so one is, can they evaluate talent? And what I talked about, I did a little seminar back when I was really active within uh, Tech Coast Angels. And I had just led that first deal that I talked about where I was didn't even know what I was doing, but I had a co-lead who was very experienced and he helped me get it done. And so I sat on a board and I said, the thing that being going through that process is the thing I valued most in the CEO was self-awareness, knowing what you're good at and knowing what you're not and figuring out ways to add resources in areas that you're, you're just not that strong. Because if you're, if you're continually beating your head against the same wall, trying to do things that you know you're not good at and just look back through your life and see, okay, what am I good at? Am I a visionary type CEO? Am I an operational type CEO where I'm really focused on the detail? Whatever you are, just know what you are, know what you're good at, know where you need to add talent. To me, that's, that's the key. And then the resilience piece, I think, gosh, what I've learned is there's so many obstacles along the way. And so you need somebody who's just got that almost superhuman ability to, to respond to disappointment and defeats. And it, it might get you down for a day or an afternoon or whatever. But then the next day you're like, hey, it's a new day. This is, this is going to make the, the final success of the company that much sweeter. It makes for great stories. And I think that's what you're looking for, that self-awareness, that resilience. And so I look predominantly at the CEO and so early on, we looked at a lot of team dynamics and you want to make sure it's, there's no dramatic dysfunction in the team, but so many things can change with the team. For me, it's like the jockey is big. And I think for a lot of investors who've done a lot more investing than I have, they've said the same thing. And I, I agree with that. I don't know, Craig, what you think? Yeah, that's critical. And actually that kind of leads into my next question for you. You had talked earlier about knowing yourself and emotions and how in the beginning you are me I, I tell you i've experienced this a lot where you're angry you just don't know that you're angry you're going <laughs> through this stressor and you don't even realize that you're 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 so in the middle of a fight it's almost like you're in a bar fight and you're <laughs> you're you've got sheets of blood pouring out and you don't even recognize where exactly. it came from or the how beer bottle hit you on the forehead yeah. but you didn't you, you don't notice <laughs> you didn't the blood. Even see it <laughs> yeah and that's so common in entrepreneurship because you know in the middle of a fire it's hard to just be self-aware and so Maybe tell the audience how important is it for us to know our emotions, be aware of yourself, and really to take care of yourself. Yeah, I think that's it's critical. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs, that's why a lot of entrepreneurs are young, because you can get away with it when you're young. Obviously, your body can take a lot more abuse as you get older. You realize, oh, pounding my head against that brick wall doesn't work too well. And there's other parts. What you're trying to do with legacy formation is make sure that the the whole life of the entrepreneur is there, right? Because so, so many times they make so many sacrifices for the, for the business that other parts of their life can really take a hit. But yeah, it's just like whatever you can do. And we were talking a bit about the mindfulness piece, which is if you can get quiet and learn that your body will give you tons of signals on how it's doing. And it's hard to tap into that. But just knowing when you need to take a break, knowing when you have to add resources, knowing when something's not working, and we talked about all this, whether you're an entrepreneur and entrepreneurs get the right people on the bus and in the right seats. That's something you hear so much in business, people in their right roles, because nothing creates more stress in teams is when you're asking somebody to do something that they're just innately incapable of doing, right? They want to do it. They want to help the team, but it just doesn't play to their strengths. And so if you can have, again, evaluating talent as a CEO and knowing who can do what, just innately having that interest and having that awareness in yourself, what do you need? And also looking at other people and recognizing strengths like that. I think that's the power of a leader is seeing what people do really well and knowing what motivates them. So you're putting them in a role where they can work to their passion and you're not asking them to do stuff that's inconsistent with their skills or inconsistent with their passion, right? And so Dave Burkus, who is one of the super angels I worked with, has a great TEDx talk about that, about getting people in the right seats. And he's got a really funny story. I sent it to Travis about 
that. I won't spoil the things, but if you just go to um, YouTube and search Ted Burkus TEDx, it should come up. And he's got a great talk. I won't give away Dave's secret, but he talks a, a, a lot about that. And I, I, Dave was a, a great guy for me to work with. I valued every time I had an interaction with him. I, I looked at a when I was stepping off the board and I had lost confidence in the CEO, the company I was doing that for. Luckily, it was a time where the, the next round was oversubscribed. And I, I wanted to get out of that deal. And so I did. And so as a board member, my fiduciary responsibility was to every investor who invested in the round that I led for that I sat on that board seat. So I just emailed everybody and said, look, we've got an opportunity to take a partial exit for everybody who invested in the A. Dave was one of the guys that invested in the A. And Dave's like, yeah, I want to sell. I'm like, how much do you want to sell? Because you could pick what percentage of your holding you wanted to sell. It wasn't so oversubscribed that everyone could sell 100%. But I just took what people wanted to sell. And then if that was still oversubscribed, we just arithmetically moved it down. But Dave was one of the guys that said, I just want to sell everything. Because it was an opportunity to do like 4X, have a 4X return. And not that much time, maybe like 18 months. But that was the benefit of he had done like 200 deals. And he was like, haven't heard much from the company. 4X sounds pretty good to me. Yeah. <laughs> and it's because we had a conversation because I was very curious. And so, and that turned out to be, you know, we, so he and I both, Want, tried to sell 100%. We were only able to sell about 50%. But And that, that was the company that ended up, they had done two more major fundraisings. They had raised about $10 million and they just shut their doors in, in April of this year, which was really unfortunate. They had so much promise, but again, a couple different times. Product didn't maybe have everything that that external sales force wanted to sell or needed to sell. And so that's when you have your own sales force really going out and doing the guerrilla sales and the guerrilla marketing to get stuff sold, just getting revenue on the board however you need to do that and you know, the company didn't do that and ultimately i my personal opinion is that's what really caused his demise ask uh, you step back to the whole self-awareness and, and the mindfulness you talk about this state of mind of just being calm or so so i want to just see if you have anything to say about personal finances and entrepreneurs and when they're really freaking out <laughs> <laughs> every day and there's everything but Calmness. There's nothing that is still. Everything's changing. There's chaos. And do you see now in the past couple of years in your own personal experience that you don't have that financial burden anymore? I mean, you're stable. You're solid. So now you can think clearly. Do you have anything to say about personal finances and, and that state of mind or anxiety? or? I think just in general, emotion is is the enemy of, of making good decisions typically. And so that's why you need to have, they talk about some presidents, right? Having their cabinet and their kitchen cabinet as an entrepreneur. You need to have people who are familiar with your situation. And when you are freaking out, you can talk to them. Even when you're freaking out, and that's, I think, Craig Funkins as that advisor to say, hey, I think you're making a decision you really need to relook at. And so I think that's the thing. It's just recognizing when you're full of emotion, sometimes you can make poor decisions. I think Warren Buffett says that, be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy. And so that kind of acceptance of the psychology of decision making that you really need to kind of take that second look and say, okay. And I think it's almost impossible to do by yourself. I mean, that's I've come to that realization again. We were talking before we came on the air. I've come to that realization is that there's so much joy, so much benefit to giving to other people and then having people helping you out. And you know that they've that they've got your back, you know, that you've been through a few different situations. And so they really just want to see you succeed. They're friends of yours or relatives or whomever. And they, they might have skin in the game, they might not, but they just want you to succeed because you've, it's a real relationship. You've given to them, they're giving to you, and they can, they can help you make those decisions. You know? And if you're not doing that, and a lot of times you think, how do I have time to do that? And it's almost the same thing as that sales force thing. It's you, you think you don't have time to do it, but it really is such, you, do have, you have to make time for it. And if you do, it can pay amazing dividends. And so... It's the things that you need to make time for that actually save you time in the long run because you, you, you know it's gonna, you're going to save yourself from a really bad decision. But again, what we were talking about resilience is that's one of the reasons why I'm not an entrepreneur or I haven't been is because I, I can get locked in to you know, deer in the headlights mode with decisions because I'd always, I'd always had a lot of money and a lot of time. And so you're used to making decisions in that entrepreneur. Things move very fast. So that was the other quote. 
I posted, I think on LinkedIn or whatever, that I just, I'm surprised I've been in the business world almost 30 years. And I just read that quote for the first time, like four months ago when it was a Teddy Roosevelt quote. He said, the best thing you can do today is to make the right decision. The next best thing you can do is make the wrong decision. The worst thing you can do is don't, is make no decision. And so that's, I think, what an entrepreneur, that's where the resilience comes in is you're not going to make all your, all your decisions right. The big decisions, you want to try to get them as close to right as you can. But I think entrepreneurs, the great ones, know that they're making the best decision they can with imperfect amounts of information, but they know that there's a chance it could be the wrong decision, and then they'll readdress it when, when that becomes obvious. And I think that's the difference between an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur. Is that's the, that's the skill set that, that I need to develop even at the stage of my career, right? And you can do that in all parts of your life, right? And it's kind of that perfectionism. Zuckerberg said that, you know, perfect, perfect is the enemy of good enough or whatever. That, that idea that you have to know what's good enough to get the job done and don't again when i was working on that submarine we talked about earlier the parchy the guy was now it turns out I, I didn't know it but he was very famous and knew the president and all that and he's like don't don't spend too much time polishing cannonballs and so that was a joke and when we finished up the work we did we actually gave him a, a ball bearing that looked like a polished cannonball because the idea is that what's a cannonball used for right why are you polishing it type thing so don't spend too much of your time polishing cannonballs and and that's the minimal viable product type type ideas. Don't spend a lot of time and a lot of money working on something that may not be what the customer needs. I'm so glad you mentioned Teddy Roosevelt and his quotes. We, our last interview spoke about exposing yourself to the classical wisdom. And I can't tell you how many times I've made mistakes in business to come to find out that it was classical wisdom that I was not aware of. And I stepped on a landmine that probably a thousand years worth of men has just stepped in. <laughs> yes. It's humbling for sure. I know a lot of these guys listen to even podcasts and stuff that's just relevant, but it's just this generation, how yeah. important it is to expose yourself to the history of man's uh, mistakes. Cause we always repeat the same mistakes, especially if we cut ourselves off from that wisdom. I'm sure everyone here has heard man in the arena by Teddy Roosevelt, but sometimes I take that for granted that, Yes. These guys aren't exposed to that kind of stuff. Yeah, about the critic, you mean, in the man. Yeah, yeah, I love yeah. that quote. Before before we end, I wanted to give you a chance to talk about just mentors in your life. You had mentioned about in investing that you had had some guys, what maybe it was Bill, yeah. uh, Bill Payne. How important was that for you to have that mentor as you're kind of embarking on a new journey in your life, like investing? or? Yeah, I think that's something that, I wished I had been more aware of and more appreciative of, but I had to get a little older. So that's part of time now that I'm spending is reconnecting with folks and making sure they understand. I remember how much help they gave me and how much I appreciate it. And I probably didn't show enough appreciation at the time, but I truly did appreciate it. And every step of my career, so much help and so many people were so open to it. And when I was working for the military, I worked with this PhD from MIT, John O'Day, great guy. And he taught me so much about making sure you had, he talked about one order of magnitude. Like, you know, don't work things out to like five orders of magnitude and then you're way off. He's like, just ballpark it and say, okay, am I in the right ballpark? Do I have an order of magnitude? One order of magnitude, is this right? Does this make sense? And that was just such great wisdom and he was a great mentor and and everywhere i've gone i've had had good mentors at every step of the way one guy that i've reconnected with was bob vanerak he was a ceo of sensormatic and he and he gave me a lot of different advice on how to navigate the corporate world like what to do when you're a lot of entrepreneurs they don't need to worry about this but maybe it's they can use it in a different part of their life bob told me this i never forgot it was like what do you do when you can't get your boss to see what you think is the right thing to do. And he gave me great advice. He's like, JP, three times, that's my rule. Three times you you go to somebody and you, you try to use a different approach to convince them of what's right to do. If you still believe it's the right thing to do, you have to go around them at that point. You've done it the right way. You've given them the opportunity to see it your way. But if you feel so strongly about it, and it can jeopardize your career if you do it, but if you feel that strongly about it, that it's the right thing to do, go around them after three tries. And I reconnected with Bob recently, and I told him i never forget exactly where we were when he gave me that advice, and it was great advice. And he had a, a bunch of things like that. If you have a personal problem with someone, and I, luckily I had done this already, one-to-one, -one, right? And so I can't even remember who taught me. You praise in public and you coach in private. 
You know, you never want to humiliate anybody. And so that's, I think, as an entrepreneur, you have so little time. But if you take that extra time, always make sure you're coaching in private first. You never want to public humiliate anybody. And I just go by the golden rule. And that's how, through my management career, I always tried to manage people the way I wanted to be managed. That was another thing I said within corporate world. It's like, I, I never worried about how to motivate my folks. I always said, hire self-motivated people and don't demotivate them, right? Because so, so many right. times in management, they just make, and myself included, you can make really dumb decisions to demotivate people. If you hire self-motivated people, smart people, and resilient people, and you don't demotivate them, I think that's the kind of team you want to build. Yeah, and Bob gives good advice. I actually used that on my kids yesterday. <laughs> we assigned three pickup police, we call them. And their job is to go around and tell everybody to pick up their mess. And I said, if they don't listen to you, I pick like some of the younger ones. So naturally, if they go to an older person, they're going to want to just push them to the side. Right. I said, then you go get one of the other police. And by then, I gave them a little ticket system. <laughs> And I said, if that doesn't work, then you go over the head and you come to me and I'll handle the situation. <laughs> <laughs> this is how you manage 11 kids. I right? manage my kids. <laughs> yes. I always wondered how you guys were doing it. So that was, that's yeah. good. It, it works. It's like yeah. the rule of three. I think it's a good one. But that was great advice. And so, again, the, the question was mentors. And it's like you have that on your website, right, about standing on the shoulders of giants. And it's it's a huge thing. And I think just showing the appreciation, again, it goes back to, to being authentic and, and making sure people understand how appreciative you are of that. Yeah, and I think the logic there is there's, there's no point in reinventing the wheel. And if you think the wheel was tough to invent, you ought to try inventing the business. <laughs> and to, to invent, so many entrepreneurs invent business for the first time mm -hmm. instead of just standing on the shoulders of the giants around them that have already done it. Yeah. And then from there, you can go further. Mm -hmm. You can get into that new territory. There's no point in reinventing what everybody already knows. Yeah. Hey, thank you so much for your, for your time and your testimony. I really appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. It's, uh, it was a pleasure.